What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Swingman Podcast. It's podcast number 114. As ever, I'm your host, George St. Ledger, joined as I am all the time by Louis Halpin and Lewis Howard. NBA All-Star Weekend has come and gone, and we're now on the path to the playoffs in the, the cringiest sense of what we could figure with some alliteration that we've got going on here. Uh, we're going to just art back to the All-Star Weekend. And guys, did you enjoy the NBA All-Star Game? Uh, I would say the All Star Game. Personally, I uh, I'm not going to go as far as Mike Malone, who absolutely detested it. But yeah. it it you have to I think accept it for what it is. It's at the point now where they're not playing the game like it's like life on the line. You got to win it. Although there was that one where in Cleveland, which, which was a bit better than than the usual one, but this year was definitely a you know, the stars are out, you just, you know, they put on a bit of a show, but the actual game itself isn't a standard NBA game. There's, they're not really fighting to see, you know, who is the best player in the NBA amongst all of the All-Stars. But I think if you accept it before it is more of an exhibition type of style, then you'll enjoy it more. But personally, I, I wasn't the biggest fan of it. No yeah, I, I never really enjoyed the game too much. I thought this one was particularly lacking in uh, <laughs> defensive effort. I think more, <laughs> although LeBron did uh, injure himself with a little block attempt. On yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it was quite funny. Um, but yeah, the, the, these types of games, as Lewis said, they're intended to be exhibition. They're not going to put the effort into it because they don't want to get hurt for the real games that actually matter. I enjoy the sort of like surrounding noise that comes with the All Star, like the selections and everything, because that I think that's kind of important in sort of like the fabric or the history of the game, seeing who's getting these All Star selections. And obviously, like players make money based in, on All Star selections, they've got like built in bonuses for that type of thing. So um, I enjoy that aspect more than I do the actual game. Uh, there, there's always some fun moments. And, uh, you know, there, there was the nice little Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown back and forth, which I was probably the, the moment I enjoyed the most from this game. And I enjoyed the, like, televised live draft fit aspect yeah, of this one. Yeah, that was good. Thing. Um, and it didn't feel too sort of awkward or bad that, like, you know, the people who were last picked, basically. I know Jokic basically was like, I'm not going last, which I thought was fair enough, given he's the reigning two-time MVP. Um, so, yeah, I, I enjoy the surrounding noise to do with All-Star Weekend. The game, not so much, but it's a nice uh, welcome break, I guess, for for a lot of the players. Um, to Even if, they, I mean, if you're not playing, they're going out somewhere, some some holidays or whatever, and if they are playing, they're just taking it easy, which I can understand. Yeah, I don't really know how... There's been a lot of, obviously, talk afterwards because everyone was moaning, particularly about the game. And this has been like a common theme with not just the All-Star game, but other things in All-Star weekend. I don't really know how they can fix it because if the players don't care, there's not really too much that they can do, ultimately. It isn't like... You, you always see, oh, oh, we don't get All-Star games like this anymore. And they throw it back to sort of like 15 years ago when Kobe and everyone was like really trying hard. If the players don't care, ultimately nothing's ever going to change. They can't really incentivize it in a way of which will make players care. They can add a bit of money into it, but the players earn so much money anyway that they're not going to bother trying to get injured in the utmost crucial part of the season, which is always known after the All-Star break. So it's a little bit of a strange one. The other point and the factor of what I wanted to get to you is this was the other heavily criticized area of NBA All-Star Weekend. Is it time to end the dunk contest? Because even though Matt McClung did really well and he had, I think the NBA have been promoting that he got like the most engagements, the most views of a dunk contest ever or, or, or whatnot. I think everyone can agree the dunk contest is no, it has no appeal. It, it, well, it has no appeal for what it used to have anyway. There's probably some small part of it for players that are up and coming in the league like Matt McClung. But the, the dunk contest just doesn't have that sex appeal that it used to have anymore. And it's sort of sad to see now. And people have blamed it on sort of, I mean, Stephen A did a thing where he was blaming it on LeBron James is the reason why the dunk contest sucks. I don't think it's that. I think there's you can obviously put a factor into it of saying that like if LeBron James, the league sort of poster boy for however many years, never wanted to do it, there's something wrong with it in that regard. I don't think it is solely that. But do you think it's time to for the NBA to look at maybe leaving it away from All-Star Weekend for a couple of years and seeing if that brings back the hype for it or not and trying something new? Or do you think it's just a staple of, of All-Star Weekend? 
I think it's a staple of All Star Weekend, obviously. But uh, although I don't put a hundred percent, oh, <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't put something on it. You oh, want to see? Back. We lost yeah, you there for a while. Uh, I, I saw that. I was I was completely frozen then. But yeah, I I do think you need some of the star players of the league and. You know the high the people that do a lot of the highlight reels in the actual NBA itself. You want to see them in the dunk contest, and when you don't have them, and you know this is taking enough, nothing away from someone like a Matt McClung, who was fantastic this year, and it was the best year that's been since probably the Aaron Gordon Zach Levine rivalry that happened uh, quite a few years ago now. Yeah, that was 2016, I think, wasn't it? That was a yeah, long so time ago now. Per- personally, I think the the best way to help it isn't to leave it out it's just to, to have the stars in it but as you say you got a like with the all-star game you have to incentivize them to do it and how do you do that I, I really don't know at this point yeah they really seem to like i think like lose, using lebron james as, as an example um i don't think i'm not sure why he has never done it i, I guess there's a couple of different things in there or someone like zion as well maybe they don't see themselves as like super skilled dunkers and it's more about like and they're an in-game dunkers if that makes sense the same with Ja Morant as well i think that's what he said um so it's not that it doesn't really appeal to them and it like maybe uh, maybe they're a little bit scared of being embarrassed i don't know what it is but i think that's probably the main way to do it because um when you think of iconic uh dunk dunk contest moments um i mean disregarding sort of like, i mean zach levine and aaron golden are good players but the ones i think of more are like vince carter and yeah. mark Gordon, of course <clears throat> when he done it from the free throw line um those are like you know really high up there in terms of like all-star very famous players so i think that would help but also i don't think i really mind the idea of giving it a little break because with the dunk contest, how many things can, like, how much innovation can there be yeah. with it, if that makes sense? So I think maybe like a little bit of a break to give people some more ideas, some like an extra couple of years. I'm not sure if that will help or not, but in my head, like they're just trying the same thing like year in, year out, and it's just not very exciting anymore. Um, yeah. So yeah, those are the, those are the two main aspects of it. I don't mind it being there. It's not like, I'm offended by it or anything like that, but it is a bit of a sad sight. I do agree. The uh, the idea that I sort of had pondering upon me, because obviously there's been loads of things for it. There was rumours that the NBA once tried to pay like Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Tracy McGrady and Vince Carter each like a million dollars to do one. And, and this is what I mean though. The money for that, that that's peanuts relatively to these guys. Like mm. If they don't want to do the dunk contest, a million dollars isn't going to shift the needle for them. But the idea that I had, for uh, two little star NBA dunk contest changes was if you even if you keep the main one maybe have one of like older like not old players but like the older players that still think that they can dunk that do it because you see it all the time with Shaq and Charles Barkley saying I can still dunk the ball better than half the guys in this league or something or the alternate one was having a spot on the all-star game for the person that wins the dunk contest because primarily that is an incentive for players to it they're not being called up for all-star games and they're not getting it and if they're in that sort of peripheral range there is an incentive there to do it because i I think the all-star the the skills challenge is actually quite entertaining to watch and the three-point contest normally and it still does get really big names for it so there needs to be some form of incentive so i don't know if a, a spot on the all-star game is a bit too much or if it then takes away from sort of the honor of being in the all-star game from the other guys but you know it's something to to ponder i it, it was my yeah, I think, it. i think logistically the uh getting a spot on the all-star game for winning the dunk contest would be a hard thing to to work out like how, for example like who gets picked for the process of getting picked to compete in it because you'd have to have some sort of rigorous process for that because as you say with the what you get with being an all-star you know some people might feel hard done by that they didn't get chosen to be to even be a participant oh, in the, this in is the, not this is not a foolproof brand this is yeah yeah this, <laughs> yeah. Is, this is spitball into the max is what this is yeah but as you say i just think they need to get creative and find a way to bring a bit more pizzazz let's say to the to the all-star and uh, to the dunk contest Indeed. Right. Anyway, we'll um, 
we'll leave All Star Weekend there from Salt Lake, Utah, which is an interesting acronym that you got on all of the shirts from it. But we'll move on from that. Uh, and we'll talk about the path to the playoffs that we mentioned before. So as always, whenever NBA All Star Weekend does shut down, everyone shifts their focus. This final stretch of the season, the 20 odd games that are left, is always known as the most important within the NBA. And as such, obviously, trade deadline went and gone as well. And people have got, gone in buyouts and the trades are all set and teams are locked in now for this playoffs. So, I mean, we'll talk about some of the guys that did get bought out and did get traded that we didn't talk about too much on our preview on our preview show. So we had the Clippers land in Westbrook. Does that move the needle forward or backwards for the Clippers, in your opinion? <laughs> oh, I don't. Uh, Silence. <laughs> yeah, so it, I think the needle is minimally, is even moving at all. It's just like there for me. I mean... Yeah, uh, the issue is with with Russ, I guess, is like, I, I just want to know what type of role they envision him having in this team, which is always as it is. I don't think he was too bad this season, particularly, until it got to the last couple of weeks um, where he knew he was going to be traded, probably. I, I mean, um, in that uh, LeBron, where, where he broke the scoring record game, he was playing very strangely. And then I think in the game just before he got traded, he was just like not with the team whatsoever. So I can't imagine the type of impact that had on this sort of like overall team morale at that stage. But yeah. he was before that playing reasonably well in like a sixth man role. And I think there is, I guess, space for that here. The, the Clippers have quite a lot of players already. So it, that's where my apprehension comes in. It's a lot of moving parts. Um, in my head, I guess it's a better fit for him than the Lakers was. Lakers were because the two best players on this team can, sh you know, consistently shoot outside, whereas LeBron and Anthony Davis can't. Yeah. Um, so there is maybe room for Kawhi, Paul George, and Russell Westbrook to play all together. And of course, Russ and Paul George played together in OKC, seem to have quite a good relationship there. But in terms of needle moving, uh, I think them getting Eric Golden at the trade deadline is probably more of an important move for them in terms of like championship potential. I don't think, I, I don't know about you, I'm kind of down on the Clippers. I don't really care about them that much. I don't see them as a real a contender, if I'm if I'm quite honest. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think how, the how issue with the Clippers, I think the issue with the Clippers is one we've had for a while where, when we think about, you know, where, where do we have them in terms of championship contention? And it's just that they, they never seem to get enough time together come playoff time and it's just time you can't buy back once once a team has its identity towards the end of the season you know there, there are outliers like boston last year for example in the second half of the season just completely flipped the script but i'd say that's more an outlier than it is something that can regularly happen and as it gets later in the season once your team is who it is it's a very difficult thing to play your way out of that and get into some form for the playoffs in terms of Russ being a fit, it's better than the Lakers because there is a lack of playmaking on that Clippers mm -hmm. team. I think we see that we've seen that a lot in past playoffs where they look quite disjointed on offense. So maybe he could help, but the problem with it is whether Russ can keep those turnovers down because some in some games, even though you know he is obviously a great player, but it can become a liability, especially towards the end of games. So maybe if he can keep the turnovers down, which he has at some points this season, and he can offer some playmaking that the Clippers usually lack. And as Louis said before, Paul George was playing very well with him when they were in OKC. Maybe, maybe it could move the needle a little bit, but as Louis said, I don't think it's enough where they would be in one of my perennial favourites to make the finals. Uh, I'll give... Maybe because we're a bit down on him because, you know, whatever. It's been a rough couple of years for us. But, um, like, I'll give him this. I don't think really he's athletically declined that much, if I'm being fair to him. I mean, I don't think he's the athlete he was in his prime, obviously. He was phenomenal in that regard. Um, but he can still get up there, and he's still quite fast. And I never perceived him as a great playmaker. I know he's averaged triple doubles and all that, but I put that down to usage more than him being like a real cerebral playmaker, if I'm quite honest. He does have those capabilities more so than they had 
at the minute and that they had with John Wall. He's an upgrade on John Wall pretty much in every aspect. So that's something, I guess, positive to take away from, but I don't think it's going to swing anything. And it may be just to keep Paul George happy. I don't know. I don't know if he really he's signed an extension. Who cares? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Not not all assists are created equal. You could say you know, he's not someone yeah. that's going to set up an offense like a like a Chris Paul. Let's say no, no. I just the the way I see and 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 look at the Westbrook situation with the Clippers is that now I mean there's there's people that are suggesting that he's going to be an instant starter for them, whether that's Terrence Mann or not, or if he becomes the sixth man. I think on the aspect of purely looking at this. Russell Westbrook on 40 million a year is a bad asset for an NBA team. Bad asset just in general. On a minimum vet of sort of what? It's it's like 750k or 2 mil, the contract is. I think it's an excellent piece for the Clippers for it. You can, there there is ways in which around that he's going to do. But for the last 20 games of this season, he's going to be motivated to just come in. He's happy. When he accepted that sixth man role for the Lakers, I don't think anyone would say he was bad for them necessarily. I think the fit was a bit peculiar but that was always the case there i can't see a way in which this is a bad thing for the clippers and when you look at it in the terms of the the vegas and all of the bookies when he signed their odds drifted they got they become less of a favorite to win the championship i can't work that one out in my head necessarily because he adds depth he adds experience i know he's never won it all and all this sort of stuff but it's more of that i can't see how this is a lose for the clippers in in that regard like you said an upgrade on John Wall in every way possible. He's relatively healthy as well. So if they do need him, he's going to yeah. be there. And I think it's, it's just another piece for the Clippers. I don't think they're going to win it anyway, but I think he will improve them. And then depending on what happens next year, he'll be at the Rockets or wherever he is on, on a bigger contract. That's just how it will how it will play out. But yeah, that, that's pretty much it for me and, and my two-piece on, on Westbrook there. Um if we move over, another person that, well, isn't, isn't going to be playing is uh, Lonzo Ball. He's been shut down for the season from the Chicago Bulls. Uh, there was rumours around the Christmas time that he was started running again and dunking and things like that. But to no avail, he has been shut down for the rest of the season because of this lingering knee injury that he's had for, for a long time now. Do we actually ever think Lonzo Ball is really going to be back? Or do we think that this is just a general thing where he just needs a little bit of time of rehab and he'll be back next season looking like his old self? Um, well, I think, I think the injuries are definitely starting to become a worry. You know, Once you see a player starting to collect them, it's usually something that doesn't go away. But I think he is the type of player and the qualities he has that it's not going to affect him as much as it would affect some other people, I think. And in terms of shutting down for the season, I mean, I mean, the Bulls have just had a really disappointing season anyway. So I think if there was any bit of doubt where they didn't potentially want to rush him or cause further aggravation, you know, they, they were just going to say, okay, you know, just don't play for the rest of the season. It's not like we're going to be making too many, too many waves anyway. And I think the Bulls have got a lot of thinking to do. Uh, in the off season and probably over the next few months as well, when they decide what they want to do with the future of their franchise. So, I think this is a move most people were expecting to happen. For some reason, when you said the Bulls, I was thinking about like the family, <laughs> like the Bulls. Like, <laughs> oh, out no, their... no, I didn't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> They're putting out their next decision. Um, yeah, I do think it is quite concerning. I think it's still quite concerning because they, I don't think they really know what the issue is, which is probably like the overriding sense of like anxiety i guess with that if they don't know what the issue is how can you really predict how he's when how or when he's going to come back to be honest um i do agree like his strengths don't really lie in physical presence if that makes sense he's a good defender which is something that i would keep an eye on if he's sort of like side to side movement like someone like clay is probably not as good a defender as he was a couple of years ago because of you know the two big injuries that he had so that's something i'd keep an eye on but I mean, playmaking wise, he's so so good. Um, I think people forget, like before he got injured last season. I think the Bulls were the number one seed, and that's even with them like losing to like any team that was like good. good. Um, yeah. He had like a really sizable impact on how that um, how that offense ran, and obviously he's a great defender as well. And I think that's uh, I think where they are now and where they were last season is pre- a pretty big testament to his qualities. Um, and I think. 
if you'd have asked a lot of people before he got injured last season, like, oh, we should have got this guy. If, if he was available, we should have really pounced on it because I think he is one of the better point guards in the league. And his shot making was coming along a lot better as well. Um, you know, those first couple of years for the Lakers, I think were quite hard on him, the pressure of that franchise, the pressure of his dad and everything like that, his family. So, um, yeah, it's really sad to see. I hope he can come back in some capacity relatively soon. Part of me doesn't expect it because, like I said, they don't know what the issue is. But um, I wouldn't be surprised if somehow, like, you know, it gets down the line or whatever and um, him and his brother are playing on the same team somewhere. Uh, I, I wouldn't Ooh. be surprised to see that. Um, maybe, like, that they just cut their losses because he's um, too injury prone or something like that. Or maybe Lamelo <laughs> forces his way out of Charlotte. But, um, yeah, uh, I, I want to see him back on the call. He's a great player. All right, one word answer. The Bulls currently sit in 11th. They're one spot out of the play-ins. Do they make the play-in playoff places? One word. Give me a second, but check the standards. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that as well. They're, 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 11th, they're 11th currently. Yeah, it's more about who's above them. Um, yeah. Are they going to make play-ins? Well, ooh. just looking at I, these here. So. I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say yes. And Louis, you're they, saying so that's tenth. That's tenth minimum, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I'm gonna say yes. Yeah. No, I don't think they do. I think the I, think, I think the Raptors and the Wizards are better teams. Although I do expect the Nets to slip, obviously, um, given given the trades that they made at the deadline. But I think the ball, the Raptors, the Wizards, the Hawks, the Heat. Yeah, they're all better than them. Uh, so yeah, I could well, even uh, see the Pacers making a bit of a steamroll now that Halliburton's back. We'll uh, we'll talk about that trade. So obviously, we were all slandering the Phoenix Suns, and then out of nowhere, they landed Kevin Durant, which now puts them into. I don't think they're. I think they're the second favorite to win. With I think the Celtics are still the overriding favorite to win the NBA championship this year. But obviously, when you acquire Kevin Durant, you instantly become title contenders or title favorites, along with CP3, DeAndre Ayton, and Devin Booker that they've got. In your head, are the Phoenix Suns now the favourite to win it all, or do you still not see any sun shining down in Phoenix? I, I think I'd agree with the bookies. I think I'd have them second. I think the Celtics are playing really well, and they they have been for the whole year. Uh, I, I will say, you know, we said before, you know, is the Suns' window closing? Some, uh, I think we all probably said yes. And then they added Kevin Durant, and that just blows that out of the water. Because for yeah, me, yeah, they've just they've just insta locked the window open now for like another couple yeah. of years, realistically. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, KD's a minimum top three player in the NBA. I'd probably have him second only to Yanis. Uh, so when you add someone like that, I instantly think it makes them favourites in the West. I, I do like Denver, and I think Denver's time's been coming for a while. And, you know, obviously, injuries have had an impact on that. But when you look at that starting line up for the Suns it just matches up to pretty much anyone in the NBA and yeah I've, I've always been pretty high on KD so I, I'm going to be back in the Suns but as I said I'd still have the Celtics Celtics over them yeah I mean if you can get I don't want to state the obvious and say I think it was a really smart move because if you can get <laughs> Kevin there's there's not often like a player of his caliber is traded like we're talking top like for like 15 players of all time i can't remember where we put him when we've done the list but maybe a little 13. bit higher. yeah something of the sort so yeah um, if you can get a player like that you get it and i know the cost was reasonably heavy but they got the best player in the trade and now they are i think yeah yeah I, i'd put them on a sort of like if we were doing it as a tier list i think it's denver and phoenix at the top of that and we've said the whole season that the West Western Conference is kind of wide open. Um, if someone wants to make that big swing trade, go for it because there's a high chance you could make the NBA Finals because uh, then you go further down the thing and you've got concerns about the Warriors. The Grizzlies have been really poor over the last couple of months, if I'm quite honest, uh, at least the last 10 games or so. Um, and then, well, the Lakers are an absolute mess. Uh, well, we'll get on to them, I guess. Um, yeah. And... Who else are we really looking at there? The Clippers, I guess you could say as well, with with Kawhi and Paul George back. But there's always those. Well, none of us have a 
truly believe in the Clippers, if we're quite honest with ourselves. I don't think any of us have ever thought that the Clippers are going to win an NBA championship over this period. So I think it was pretty um, pretty smart. Well, yeah, pretty smart move to just try and chase that window because we were all saying that that window is closing. Um, I would put them above Denver, I think. That that offense just like, that the offensive potential of, uh, you know, but Chris Paul... KD and maybe DeAndre Ayton can play a little bit better if he just like focuses a bit more on like defense and like alley hoops and stuff like that when they've tried to get him to do more advanced stuff over these last couple of months it hasn't gone as well um, and maybe being on a better team will motivate him a little bit more I'm not too sure obviously their depth now is a little bit concerning you would say that's the one area or aspect where you can point to being like a yeah, they're, they're a little bit shy, but that, that starting lineup can blow anyone out of the water. And defensively, KD is really good as well. I know they lost Bridges, who's a great defensive player, um, but I think KD might be as good. So, And he's obviously one of the best defensive players in basketball. So, yeah, um, I like it from the Western Conference perspective. Um, I think there are three teams in the East that could win it. I would probably say the Celtics at this moment in time. And I'd it's a bit of a toss up because obviously the Celtics dealt really well with KD last year, but he didn't have, he had Kyrie, but he wasn't really at his peak powers that, that, that playoffs, I don't think so. Booker is, I think the best shooting guard in the league and Chris Paul and everything like that. Um, it just, yeah. Uh, overall, I think offensively they have the ability to blow anyone out of the water. It's just if uh, they get any injuries, which they can do, I'd be concerned about that. Yeah, I think in terms of the of the West for me, with Kevin Durant now, it's hard to look past this team being the best. It is just the lack of depth is now that's in Phoenix. And Chris Paul, he's obviously a little bit old. Well, Chris Paul is just an older guy now in the league. It doesn't take away from He's not at his prime, but he's still a very good player and a point guard. But it is that lack of depth. And when it comes to the playoffs, I know the rotations shrink down and you, you won't go as far into your bench anyway. But if you do lose one of these guys, even if it's like DeAndre Ayton, then it's a big takeaway from how the Suns are going to play in general. Because Ayton's going to yeah. lose shots and he'll have to change his game anyway. That's just what happens. But that's my only concern with with the Suns. But I think if you... I, I couldn't pick between who I'd have getting out of the West between Denver and the Suns right now. I really couldn't. I think they're the two overriding favourites. I think you've got your sort of dark horses of the likes of a few of the few teams and even though this they're, they're not doing well i still can't count the warriors out i just can't when it yeah. comes to playoffs they do change but at the moment if you're looking at it it's got to be the, the nuggets or the suns but the another team that i want to talk about from the west is the dallas dynasty that's now been created the the dallas buyers club has, has been going about from everything of kyrie irving and luka Doncic. do we see this working do you think this is just a lovely little bubble that they're in where they're tapping each other on the shoulder and playing games at All-Star Weekend? Or do you think this is sort of like a a, a six-month hiatus and then Kyrie's going to be off? I mean, if you're asking me if I think Kyrie's going to be off, the answer's yes, I do, I do think he's off. I think he's probably Laker, Laker bound uh, after this season. But when you look at how it works with Luca and Kyrie this year, it's one of those decisions where you forego defense and just go all out on the offense because them two as a backcourt offensively is just insane they you know they're both two of the best shot creators and shot makers in the entire league no one can really stop either of them but defensively it's a massive liability so you know do you have any faith in defensively probably not do you have all the faith in them offensively absolutely so you just gotta see how it'll play out i think it's probably very match-up dependent, so we'll see who they play in the playoffs because they'll definitely be in the playoffs, uh, and that will probably determine how, how far they get. Yeah, I mean, I think of the games we've seen so far, the offensive sort of mix has worked quite well, I would say. I mean, Kyrie definitely played really well in his first couple of games for the Mavericks. Um you know, you always just worry. I think the first couple of weeks or the first couple of months are always quite good with him. Um, it will just take one thing that he'll just do weirdly. It'll be like, oh, 
I don't fancy coming to game one of the playoffs or something like that. <laughs> um, like that will just happen. Uh, I mean, yeah, you're, you're not wrong. Yeah. So maybe, maybe like he doesn't have enough time to like mess up the entire organization before he leaves. <laughs> um, and I, I mean, I, I've always appreciated the player's talent, but I've never, I, I, I can't imagine being on the same team as him and not knowing what to expect on a day to day basis. Um, that, I mean, I understand why they did it in the end because every year with Luca, you have, I guess, the potential to at least make the, the conference finals or the NBA finals because he's that good of a talent. And you want to maximize, you want to maximize that particular that window basically, and show him that like we we can put play, people around you if you stay with us and put the faith into us because really he's the next one people are going to be looking at and being like, oh, they they can't the organization hasn't built a team around him good enough to. To, to like Challenge. succeed with his talent, yeah. um, you know, and and he's he's had such sort of like heavy usage for this season in particular, obviously last season as well. But he had Jalen Brunson there a little bit, and I think in retrospect they probably prefer to have given Jalen Brunson that that contract, and he'd be there, and he's good off ball, good on ball. Whereas these two both need the ball in their hands. But the offensive match has worked quite quite the offensive mix I think between the two has worked quite well. I'm not too worried about that. I'm worried about the off the court issues that come when he Curry is just himself and I think he will leave as well. I agree with you. I think he's gonna to go to the Lakers. So that the you know they've shifted a couple of assets there. Dorian Finney Smith is a good defensive player. They have gone on full on like offensive blasters, but I mean when you look at the teams around them so have they we're looking at K D uh, with the Suns we kind of said the same thing. Um, and also, uh, and Denver aren't really a, a solid, solid defensive team. At least I don't perceive them as that. I'm not sure what the statistics will tell uh, you. I, I think they're quite good this year defensively, Denver, actually. I think uh, yeah, as, a collective, a as a collective unit, they're a good defensive unit. They don't have that necessarily like that defensive like style or player. Yeah, but yeah. As, a, as a unit, they all chip in, which is the whole point of it. But, and I, I'd I think... give a little shout to Aaron Gordon as well, just on yeah. that. He's, He's been good this obviously... year. Yeah. He's not the defensive stalwart that you know we'd give to some other players, but I do think he stepped up quite a lot this year. I do think there is just a a point though with some of these players like Luca, Jokic, KD, where you're not going to be able to guard them really when it comes to like they're going to get yeah. their points no matter what. So I think it's just about um, just collating this offensive talent, I guess, together and getting as many points as you can on the board because. I know, de- I mean, obviously, I'm not saying defence isn't important um, and you're going to need some people to make some key stops at key times, but I think more often than not, you can probably blast another team out of the water just offensively because that's what everyone's focusing on these days and getting as many players that can do that as possible is always a win. But uh, they're, they're in the um, lower bracket, the lower tier, I would say. Maybe in a, they're in a lower tier to the Warriors. I, I don't know about you two. For me, I think it goes like Denver, Suns, Warriors... Then maybe like them with the Grizzlies and I'd agree I with can't that. think of that. I can't think of else is even in, in Clippers maybe. Yeah, you've not mentioned the Kings, Louis yet. Like that beam. Yeah, like okay, that yeah, beam. That's a good point. yeah, I'd put the yeah. Kings. I, I would honestly put the Kings. I'm not even trying to. Yeah, like I think they're in, within that. The bracket. Kings have been like, the Kings are no joke yeah. this year. So Bonus and Fox are a dynamic duo in that regard. That yeah. genuinely are. They're really really solid. But. um Enough about them. Let's talk about everyone's beloved Lakers. Are the Lakers, the, the age-old question that comes about every 24 hours in NBA Twitter sphere, will the Lakers, and the new-look Lakers, might I add, make these NBA playoffs? How do you feel about that? Currently sitting in 13th, um, the new-look lineups, is it is it going to be is it going to be good? Is LeBron making the playoffs? That's what we want to know. Um, I'll, I'll go first in this one. Um, no, I don't think they are. Uh, <laughs> I don't really no, no. care. I mean, uh, uh, okay, I'll give the, the sort of like positive spin on things. I'll give them credit that they only used one of the draft picks. They got some decent, like the, the, their team has improved. I just don't think it's really improved as significantly, significantly as everyone's making out, if I'm quite honest. I've watched a lot of D'Angelo Russell. He's not good. He's in like he's, he's, a good he's not he's bad, not Louis. I, Louis is I mean, our resident he's Timberwolves. Fit. He's a Timberwolves aficionado here, so I think there might be something rubbing he, off on it. But he's a better fit than Russell Westbrook is, granted, and probably better than who they had before. Um, he is 
still quite heavy usage. He's so slow, it's unbelievable. He's slow going forward and he's slow going back. He slows everything down, which, you know what, fair enough. Um, he's just not that good. Um, I, like, I, I don't know what to say, to be honest. Like, I just don't think he's a, he's a great... I, I don't think he's as good as everyone's making out, basically. Um, so there's that aspect to it. I like Malik Beasley. Um, obviously, I know him from, from some Timberwolves, Timberwolves watching as well. He's a good player, but is he... I, I, I'm just looking at the teams above them, and I think the uh, Trailblazers. Jared Vanderbilt's, Jared Vanderbilt's a good addition, Louis. Jared yeah, Vanderbilt's you know, a good addition. But what, what are we talking about here? Like, <laughs> it's such <laughs> like it true. Yeah. middle, like kind of level below players, if I'm quite honest. Um, because at the end of the day, you can talk about these moves all you want. The only way they get significantly or markedly better if Anthony Davis can't can play a game without like getting a roll his ankle or something stupid and coming out for six weeks. Like that that is it. I mean LeBron's putting it all on the table and I he's doing it in a sort of like measured way. Um if I'm you know quite honest. But like the, the, the ceiling of this team is dictated by a guy who gets like croc rolling down the street. Like he, he could get injured at any given point. So I, I don't really know what to say. They've bought they've got some some role players for like what they had what they had was very low black, uh, value, and they got some decent role players. But um, I like I like the Trailblazers a bit more than them. I know they they made some odd moves at the deadline, but Damian Lillard's just been so good this season that he's kind of carrying them through. You'd expect the Jazz to slide down. Granted, I think the Thunder are still going to be the same level. They're a chance for anyone on every on, on any night. The Warriors at ninth, they're going to be they're going to be there basically. And then you have got the Timberwolves who are up and down. Pelicans, same thing. And then the Mavericks. I don't I, I actually don't really know. They've got to go up. Um so f- yeah, four places here to get in there. And I'm not sure who they're meant to be displacing, if I'm quite honest. If, say the Jazz. If, uh, if I'm looking at this here, I actually quite liked what the Blazers did at the deadline. I think Matisse Steibel, I think Cam Reddish, for what they paid, are really good additions. Along with like for what they had as as wing defenders, I think they are good. As backups as well for Jeremy Grant, I do quite like yeah. that. But of looking at what you can see from the West here, if I'm going to go from this, I think Portland make the play-in. I do. And I think yeah, the Lakers think will make well. the I think the Lakers will also make the play-ins. I think the Pelicans the are going to be in trouble. Yeah. I, I, no, I think the Pelicans are going to be in trouble, is what I'm saying. That's my whole thing from it. I think the Pels, their last 10, they've been shaky. When it comes down to this stretch of games, I can't see a way, that, that, that essentially from this, I can't see a way in which LeBron doesn't make at least the planes. I know it's all of this. He will put this team on his back to beyond belief. And do I think that they're ever going to make any dent in the playoffs? No. Do I think that LeBron can carry this team to make up three wins in the course of the next 23 or 24 games? Yes, I do. Uh, I don't think it's mainly going to be down to LeBron, to be honest. I think you know what you're getting from him. I don't think him alone is enough to... Carry this isn't, like isn't team. It isn't him alone now. He's got he has actual usable guys as yeah, backup. And he, AD's he, not going to play all these games. He'll play fifteen. LeBron will play all these games, providing he doesn't get seriously injured. If he's got like the wear and tear stuff that keeps guys questionable every night, then yeah, he, he'll be fine. But D'Angelo Russell, Jared Vanderbilt, Malik Beasley, they have actual feasible players now that can play basketball in a unit. I know Darvin Ham is all this other stuff, but I can't see a way in which three games is the gap here it's it's, it's, com- it's too small it, it, it's completely dependent on ad for me i think if ad's healthy i can't see where they don't make the plans i, I think if AD's it, healthy. The, the lakers the lake yeah exactly the lakers are a lot better not just because of the players they added but also because of how it helps the players they've currently got like this team will just be much better for lebron to operate in than it was previously but, you know, the West is so stacked now. You go to every team above them and they've got, you know, a, a minimum an all-star calibre player, if not an all-star, in their team. And the cohesiveness of the rest of the teams above them are just better currently. The Lakers have got to figure it out quick. But when you have a LeBron and an Anthony Davis, if he can stay fit, you know, that's still two of the minimum top 10 best players in the NBA when healthy. That might be doing them a disservice saying that, but I, I think you have to be a bit conservative with it with how the recent form's gone. I, I look at teams like I think they should be better on paper than the Jazz, the Thunder, 
they probably should be better than the Timberwolves. And as George said, maybe the Pelicans as well. So I, I can definitely see them making up places. It's just health is the main issue for me. Because if you have a, you know, LeBron's not getting any younger. He is quite old and he's asking a lot to put everything on him to try and pull them through. Anthony Davis has got to be there with him to help him out. And obviously, if he's healthy, I, th I think it's fine. But, you know, if he's healthy, is quite quite a question these days. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Right, we'll, uh, we'll round out this podcast with our uh, our last one. There was a bit of news last night that broke that uh, the Atlanta Hawks have sacked Nate McMillan. And uh, from that, there's been a lot of outcry that Trey Young is potentially sort of disgruntled in, the, in, in Hawkstown. He's not too happy, perhaps. Do you think, and I mean, I'm not saying on the, the banner that we've got here that the Hawks are going to sack Trey Young. They're obviously not going to do that. But do you think it's probably going it, to, it's nearing an end for Trey Young time in terms of how he plays in this Hawks team? Do you think there might be a way in which both parties part ways in the not too distant future of the off season? Oh. No, I would say he's kind of important to that franchise. He, he is that franchise in a way. <laughs> I think to, and, and I know the fans aren't particularly happy with the, his output or his play this season, but I think it'd probably be too quick of a snap decision. I know there are traits to Trey's game throughout the years that have been pretty challenging and I don't think he's ever going to win the championship as the best player on the team because he's just got such significant flaws in his game in terms of defense the amount of usage that he seems to require at this stage it's not a case of like yeah asking him oh, like you need to touch the ball a bit less we've just traded about 15 draft picks from an all-star guard from the San Antonio Spurs and he still can't do it and that's a bit of an alarm bell for me if I'm quite honest he, he's obviously he needs to be the primary player in any team that he's in and it needs to be built around him and at the end of the day he's a six foot guy who's bad on defense and his shooting is stretchy we would say like he goes through stretches of really really bad times and really really good times his good components obviously is great playmaker and he's one of the best scorers in the league when he's on it um but i don't think Firstly, I, I think he's got too much value to that franchise, but not enough value in the outside NBA circle, if that makes sense. I don't see anyone really like salivate, oh, we've got to get Trey Young in the team, really. <laughs> I, I, I mean, there are going to be teams that would like fancy that, but for what they can give up, like someone like Charlotte would probably wouldn't mind him because they're an absolutely nothing franchise at the minute. But... Like, what are they going to give up that's going to really entire other than like 16 draft picks, which would be quite nice Look, going from the Charlotte Hornets? But go on, uh, Lewis, you, I'll let, give you your two piece on this and then I'll, I'll jump on it. All right. Yeah, I um, I definitely agree that the, the issue with it is he is incredibly valuable, valued, valued at the Hawks and he's very valuable to the Hawks. They have built their entire team around him. Dejounte is a weird fit, but ultimately they're still trying to build around Trey being that guy. And I think he has a higher perceived value with them than he does around the rest of the league. So I don't really see how he gets into a better situation because, yeah. as Louis said, I do think he has to be the guy on the team with the way he plays. And I'm not sure there's another franchise unless there's one that's, you know, even worse than the Hawks are, like someone like Charlotte, I don't know, as you said, Louis, that would give him the keys and try to build around him. So I think he is in the best place for him. And, you know, Atlanta's a great place to be as well. Uh, I think the Hawks are a great franchise. When it comes to what's been happening there, though, I think there's been quite a lot of, you know, disgruntled issues at the Hawks for a while now. You hear, you know, bits here and there, and it's obviously culminated in McMillan getting sacked, which, you know, you never want to see a coach get sacked. But with, with how they've been playing and, and a lot of the talk that goes around them, I don't think it's the most shocking thing in the world. They are still eighth in the East, which is okay. You know, it's not the worst position in the world, but... It's very close around around that sort of eight to eleven range. So 
they yeah. could potentially slip out. But in, ter- in terms of where Trey would go, I'm not sure. I do think this is probably the best situation for him. It's not the the only say, thing I've gone. No, go on. Uh, it's not where they. Uh, you can say yeah, the eighth isn't a bad position to be in, but it's not where they really expected or wanted to be, like the Timberwolves as well. Yeah, they traded a load of draft picks in the summer, and they thought this is gonna bring us to like a level where they're competing for the title. And I found it quite telling that we saw a lot of activity in the Western Conference, but in the Eastern Conference, I think there's like a acceptance that. It, uh, I'd be very surprised if anyone else is in the NBA Finals from the East, apart from the Sixers, the Celtics, or the Bucks. I think there was like we can't really do much here, so let's just sort of sit on it and wait. Even like the Heat or the Knicks, who are kind of close up there, or even the Cavs. Um, I think there was just an acceptance at this stage that they're not even close to that, and that's just so markedly different from what they thought they were going to be in the summer. Really, they thought they were competing for a, at least an NBA Conference Finals there, and I don't think they even think they're close to that. Yeah, well, I mean, after 2021, they thought that this would kick them on yeah. a bit more and it hasn't happened from that. The, the way in which that I see this is that I think it'll be a telling time these next 20, uh, I don't know, I think there's what, there's somewhere between 20 and 25 games that are left. If you look at the, the Hawks roster, they've got some really, really nice pieces around them that are always sort of not linked with moves away and there's always John Collins every single trade deadline. But when you look at primarily just like excluding Trey Young and DeJounte Murray, who are your two star guys, you've got the like Clint Capella can still do a role. He's not the player that he was, but he's still he's not a bad asset. John Collins, a is a really good young guy. AJ Griffin's a really good young guy. You've got Bogdan Bogdanovich, you've got DeAndre Hunter. There are players there that for when these teams that are coming in and they're going to be drafting picks, whoever drafting these two guys, whether they get Scoot or whether they get Wembanyama. These are the sort of players where I can see them becoming available for the Hawks to move about. Because if they don't move your Trey Young and DeJounte Murray, your only options are to move your sort of next tier guys down. Yeah. And all of them are really, really solid assets for any of these teams that are going to try and build around these two new core young guys. And even if it's just players, uh, if the balls start shifting or if the Hornets start moving some of their guys like Gordon Hayward or Oubre Jr., these are the sort of players that will move. So I can't see a way in which... I can't see the Hawks improving between now and the playoffs. And I think come the new season where everything's coming about in the off ones, it will be a very different looking Hawks team by the start of next season. I'll be gobsmacked if it isn't, but it's it, yeah. that's that's how I see the I think, that's how I see the situation in Atlanta. I think obviously in a sort of theoretical sense, the way you'd want to build around Trey and I mean DeJounte's a good defensive guard, so it's not really as important for him, but you'd want a lot of length, obviously, guys who can hit shots off the catch because you're not going to be able to create chances because he has the ball all the time. And I think that's just like, that's just the pitfall of everything. Like every time you approach trying to build a team around Trey is that he needs to change his game fundamentally. If you want to go, you, if you want to win a championship, basically, and you can say they made the conference finals, but they were lucky. They came up against a Sixers team with one of the players who was just sort of like, who completely mentally collapsed, basically. I, I don't think there's really a better word or like a better phrase for it so i think they were lucky in that regard i don't think they ever really come close to that caliber of team and i think yeah it's, it's okay doing that if you're james harden in his peak and his prime i don't think yeah. trey young's good enough for that i just don't no yeah that, that's the thing i'd say you know you talk about a lot of those pieces for the hawks that that are you know, <clears throat> can be seen as quite valuable to, to some other nba franchises and, you know, you look at them, you think, you know, do you know who they'd be quite good with? They'd be quite good with, like, a Trey Young sort of play style. I think they have put some great pieces around him. It's just what the ceiling of this team is. And it's not the eighth seed where they are now, but it's not an NBA championship. And with some of the teams in the East now, as Louis said, I don't think it's a conference finals either. I don't think there's a world where they can be at the level of a Celtics or a Bucks. No, fully healthy, no. obviously. Um, you can say that they're built around Trey better than the Mavs have built around Luca. I think that's yeah. an uncontested opinion, really. Indeed. Right. Well, um, We'll wrap that one up there. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, if you aren't subscribed to us on any of our platforms across YouTube or Spotify or wherever you get your podcast from, 
please do hit that subscribe button. Follow us. Leave us a review. It would really help us out. Make sure you're following us on our socials at Swingman Pod. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok at Swingman Pod. If you drop us a follow there, interact with us. We're, we're posting pretty much every day on there. And um, yeah, check out our website, www.swingmanpod.com. And apart from that, we'll catch you in the next podcast. Thank you very much for listening and peace. <laughs>